Welcome to the Doherty Water for Food podcast. Since 2010, the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska has worked toward one goal, a food and water secure world. One in which global food security is ensured without compromising the use of water to meet other essential human and environmental needs. It's a daunting vision, but one that is vitally important. This podcast amplifies the voices of those making waves in this space. We hope you enjoy today's episode. The 2023 Water for Food Global Conference was held in May at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and produced by the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute. It was the first time the event has been held since 2019, and it was a huge success with more than 120 global speakers and 400 participants. So for the next several Water for Food podcasts, we'll be bringing you highlights from the conference, which had the theme, Cultivating Innovation, Solutions for a Changing World. In this episode, we'll hear from a senior economist with the World Bank who spoke at the conference about supporting entrepreneurship for smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. All right, so Samia, to get started, if you would please first of all introduce yourself for our audience and tell us what you do. Hi, I'm Samia Balasubramania. Uh, I work for the World Bank and I'm an environment and development economist by training. So what that means is I think about problems at the nexus of environmental issues and poverty because I look at these issues in uh, low and middle income countries. And I think about what's preventing us from solving these complex problems and uh, what could we be doing better. So a big chunk of what I do uh, personally is just understanding why things don't work very well and then thinking of how can we tweak things to make them, you know, meet, uh, uh, meet, uh, address challenges of poverty reduction, but also environmental degradation at the same time. And when we say environment, we mean a, mean a whole broad variety of things. So it's really looking at the nexus of water, agriculture, energy, health, nutrition, uh, you know, because these are all interlinked uh, interlinked challenges and you really can't separate them can't separate one from the other or solve one without really thinking about the other in the real world so that's what I do well tell me about your journey to where you are today what made you passionate about what you do today um I think I think I kind of am an accidental economist, to be honest with you, and there's a bit of serendipity to it. So I come from a culture, so I grew up in India, and I come from a culture where, you know, almost everybody, at least in my subculture in India, is encouraged to either be a medical doctor or an engineer, and I kind of didn't want to be either. And I think what I really wanted to be was, now I realize what I wanted to be was an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I don't think I necessarily had the words to describe, to, to, to quite get at that. And no one around me could tell me how you became one. And so I think it's just such a specific perspective on the world and, you know, what being quote-unquote successful means. And so I studied economics simply because I didn't want to study the rest of it. And then, uh, you know, I did a couple of internships, uh, you know, in, in undergrad and then at the end of a master's program in India. And I, I kind of, I think, understood, started seeing how you could use some of this you know, fairly dry economic theory to really help understand, uh, you know, what do you do to sort of tackle some of these problems out there? And I think I just got interested and then ended up getting a PhD in economics and in, uh, in environmental economics and policy at Duke. So I got my PhD in the U.S. And um, uh, I always wanted to look at these problems, you know, in low and middle income countries. I mean, I I come from one, right? And so I grew up in this context where, and India is a strange place, it's... Um, you know, you have some of the richest and the smartest people in the world there, and yet as a country of deeply entrenched poverty, and it stares, you know, it's looking at you all the time. You really can't avoid, you know, poverty if you grow up in India. And I think that's perhaps the motivation behind kind of, you know, serendipity, <laughs> and I think uh, just, just growing up in the context that I did and just thinking about what, what can we be doing in order to address some of these problems. So, yeah. Well, how, what brought you to the World Bank? So I was a scientist for many years. So once I got finished my PhD, I was one of those odd people who wanted to do rigorous research, but I did not necessarily see myself in an academic environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so the places on the planet that do both, you know, where you can do rigorous research for policy and implementation are 
frankly quite few and far between and and the CGIR is one of them and so I worked for the CGIR specifically for the International Water Management Institute for many many years um, I began as a postdoc and then when I left the CG I was uh, leading the research program in economics for the International Water Management Institute and that gave me a fantastic opportunity to you know really understand how do you work with um, you know, uh, development finance institutions in order to use rigorous research to actually inform policy and programming on the ground. How do you get more bang for buck? How do we course correct uh, programs that may not be working as well as we would like them to or we realize as we're implementing them that, oh, there are things that we needed to take care of because there's new information coming in. And so how do we bring that in and adaptively use it to manage where money goes and just be more responsible about Because ultimately, at the end of the day, all development finance is the taxpayer's money at the end of the day right so how do we how do we achieve effectiveness how do we how do we get better at making sure that this money is truly helping poor people you know plant more be food secure reduce poverty all of that kind of stuff and so I did that for a while and then I guess I mean I'd been you know in the CGIR for about 10 or 11 years and then um, you know uh, opportunities at the bank came along and I had a conversation with a few people and it seemed like it was a reasonable thing to do at least for a while and so here I am <laughs> kind of doing the same thing but with a different organization yeah. Well, so here you are is at the Water for Food Conference, the first global conference that we've been able to be at and be together at in four years. And uh, you uh, moderated a panel here on on Sub-Saharan Africa, which talk about poverty. That is probably the poster child for poverty there. Uh, A very interesting conversation. But tell me about some of the things that you've done research-wise that that point out what uh, the issues that Sub-Saharan Africa faces. Sure. Um, I think, so a lot of what we know about agriculture and agricultural transformation comes from South Asia and some um, information and knowledge and understanding from China. Uh, And that's important because when we start thinking about unlocking agriculture's potential in sub-Saharan Africa, um, there, there may be a a bias and a tendency to say, oh, what worked in South Asia, which is where the Green Revolution happened, Mm -hmm. and, of course, China, which had its own agricultural revolution. And so now what what worked in those contexts and how can we take those lessons and uh, implement them in sub-Saharan Africa? There's some merit to that, but I think there's also a little bit of caution to be had out there just because the history of these places is extremely different. Uh, And that matters. Uh, development policy, where we are at the moment and what we do is a function of often how we got here in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And so those histories are quite different. And so in sub-Saharan Africa, what we have is a much larger larger extended period of colonialism, a colonialism history that was perhaps even more disruptive than what it was in South Asia. I mean, history, these are the facts as they are. These are not opinions. (laughs) And uh, and, um, and, and, and post-colonial um uh you know uh governments that have struggled to to, to come together to maintain democracy etc and that's really and and against a backdrop of extreme poverty uh huge ethnic differences uh where access to resources is often mediated by those kinds of identities um and against now a backdrop of climate change and so one of the big things that's peculiar about and particular about sub-Saharan Africa is even today, most agriculture is rain-fed. And rain-fed agriculture is risky. It gets riskier under climate change when it's much harder to predict when it's going to rain and how much it's going to rain and will you get the right rain at the right time. Uh, so in a sense, sub-Saharan Africa is often locked into what we call a low equilibrium trap. Uh, there is... Governments have not invested in public goods, by which we mean infrastructure, but we also mean information, regulation, um, information on better hydrology. There's, there's There's a lot more that needs to happen out there. It hasn't happened at the pace that perhaps has happened in other parts of the world, which have been very important and necessary conditions to get private activity in as well. And by private, we mean you know, individual farmers' willingness to invest in their land, as well as any commercial um, establishments that may want to come in and create businesses around agriculture and enterprise. Uh, but the role of the state becomes extremely important, and, and, and that needs to be accelerated, um, accelerated there. 
Uh, and so, so you have a smallholder system where people have really small bits of land. So, you know, these, uh, you may have an acre of land, but it may not even be all together. They may be, it may be divided into five plots, which are not even next to one another. And so, uh, so farming is not trivial in these conditions. In fact, it's quite risky. And farmers don't necessarily think about maximizing their profits. They're concerned about minimizing their losses because they're just so risk averse. And it is such a risky environment because, you know, why would you, for example, you know, uh, why, would you, uh, why would you purchase a pump if you don't know where to drill a borehole? Right? Uh, why would you again buy an expensive piece of equipment on loan when there's a very good chance that a locust infestation will, you know, destroy your crop and you'll never be able to harvest it? So there are some really tricky and huge risks uh, that have a public goods nature component that really need to be addressed in order for this private activity, both farmers' own initiative as well as any other businesses, to take off. So that's sort of the landscape that we're operating in. Well, I mean, because as I really enjoyed listening to the panel, because that's always been something that's in, been in the back of my head. It's like I've heard about drought in sub-Saharan Africa for my entire life. Why is this still a problem? And I liked the guy who talked about the shared irrigation type system. Talk about that a little bit and how that at least this one problem perhaps you can address. No, I think that's a great question, and one of the things that's often, uh, you know, we often think about in irrigation technologies is, uh, should it be, do we sell a pump to an individual, or do we purchase a pump and get a bunch of farmers to share it? Do we form a cooperative around it? Now, this is all pump-based irrigation, but you might have the same conversation around, should we construct a pond? How does this pond get managed? Should we, you know, put pipes around this so that fields can, can be irrigated? But then who manages this stuff? Who cleans it? Who maintains it? How do we collect money from everyone to maintain the system? These are huge challenges, right? And, and, you can, and as you can imagine, in South Asia, a lot of irrigation is collective in nature, where this, which the state and the government has put, have put down and which are often managed by private individuals. And, of course, there's a lot of private investments that people have made on their own land by purchasing a pump, drilling a well, and that's theirs, and they did it. Uh, I think what's complicated in Sub-Saharan Africa is because of, the, because of where we are at the moment and because agriculture is so risky, uh, it, it becomes even harder to think about putting down equipment that might be shared by people simply because the people who are sharing it might change season to season. So because agriculture is so risky, people might farm one season and then they you know, would prefer to perhaps hire themselves out for wage labor rather than farm the land in the next season. So if you can imagine you know, putting into place a pump that everybody has to share, well, the number of people who share it is going to vary every, every season. You know? so, so cooperation for collective uh, infrastructure, collectively run infrastructure, be that a pump, be that a pond, becomes much harder to put into place when the people involved are changing season to season. And because this is a landscape where pumps are still extremely expensive, in part because they're imported, uh, one of the solutions for sub-Saharan Africa may very well be, rather than trying to sell individual pumps to farmers, can we think about rental services? And that does two things. So one, the farmer, of course, doesn't have to pay for the pump, which is, doesn't have to pay to buy it, and then doesn't have to worry about the maintenance and the repair of all of that stuff. Uh, but also one of the big things about irrigation as a service is it, it reduces the time the farmer has to spend in the field irrigating. So there's a labor saving. So this may very well be a, a viable service just given um, given the context of, 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 uh, of sub-Saharan Africa and agriculture as it is at the moment. And I think it really, it, 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 it is an innovative idea and I think it, and there's certainly a lot that our colleagues, uh, you know, spoke yesterday on the panel about, understanding how these businesses work, how do you make them viable, how do you transition into you know, a bigger business, etc. And I think there's a lot of potential out there, including thinking about renting other types of technologies that maybe people may not want to purchase themselves, but they may just want to borrow and use or have somebody come and do stuff for them. So I think this is a, I, I think, I think and, and I think that's the difference, say, for example, between South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. When we think about South Asia, most people will own their pumps. I mean, there is pump rental, but it's your, you're renting it from the per, your neighbor who owns it. This is a different context, you know. The, the, so I think, I think exploring that whole idea of how do you develop viable pump rental or irrigation service models that, 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 make profits for the companies and yet provide benefits to farmers and are not exploitative, I think is a great, is a great thing to look into. Yeah. You had a couple of women on your panel. 
Um, how much uh, does the uh, issues in sub-Saharan Africa uh, result from the fact that much of the farming is done by women? Uh, yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. And certainly what we're seeing in sub-Saharan Africa in many contexts is what we call a feminization of agriculture. So the men uh, tend to get off the land and tend to make money by doing things off-farm. Um, and uh, very often women end up end up having to or choose to farm, you know, these plots at least for some seasons. And as you can imagine, there's nothing like an idle woman. And usually what that means is that if they are doing, it's not as if they're getting a pass on doing all the other things that they were doing. They just take additional things on. And so when we think of irrigation as a service, one of the potential benefits there is that it may just reduce the drudgery and the time involved in being out there on the field and watering and standing in the sun and having to, you know, it's, it's unpleasant. It's not, it's, it's not comfortable. So there, there may be potential sort of, um, so uh, there may be potential benefits from a just reducing drudgery perspective when we think of irrigation as a saving. Of course, one of the big challenges is, I want to say this, and I think we said this on the panel too, it's not just irrigation, right? Irrigation is one of several inputs that go into agriculture. And in general, I think if agriculture has to become profitable, we have to think about just raising that entire game, not just the irrigation game. So we're talking about pest control. We're talking about fertilizer use. We're talking about markets that work well. So it's not just about connecting farmers to a market. Markets have to be you know, regulated. They have to work well in a way that farmers are able to get fair prices so that you know they can at least break, e- well, not just break even, but actually make a small profit. But it also has to be profitable for those who are purchasing these commodities from farmers, right? So it, there's a lot to be done. And this is where I mean all this sort of public goods nature activities kind of start coming in. Because for markets to work, it's you need to reduce information asymmetries. You need to reduce uncertainties. You need to reduce risks for, on both sides of, you know, the, of the people who are, pur- who are purchasing the commodities from the farmer and the farmer themselves who has to you know, produce these commodities to take them to market in the first place. So there's a lot that needs to be done. And in general, I think that would help agriculture across, you know, male or women and men. So there are, I think there are some important um, soft investments that need to be made that are vital to sort of break this low equilibrium trap. Yeah, yeah it does seem like much of it is cultural or political um, in, in nature. And that's kind, of, that's kind of hard to break through, right? The, well, what about... Uh, the Doherty Institute of Water for Food. In this particular conference, what do you think about this? Is this can we make a difference in what they're doing here? Well, I think at one level you already are, right? I mean, uh, what we saw was a bunch of wonderful, uh, you know, interesting, enterprising people coming from different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, sharing their experiences on what they're doing, how they're doing it. And really helping us um, maybe question our own assumptions on, you know, because there is a tendency sometimes to, I mean, development is complex. And when doing it at scale is incredibly complex. And there is sometimes a tendency to simplify, you know, some of those complexities just in order to get things going. But the challenge with that is you may not get very far if it's an oversimplification, right? And so one of the things that we saw particularly from that panel yesterday is, you know, folks from Uganda, folks from Rwanda, folks from Kenya, you know, all saying this is a market for pump rentals. You know, we have so far focused on trying to sell, in general, trying to sell pumps to individual farmers. Maybe that's not the approach. Maybe the approach is... You know, and this is for governments, for policymakers to say, how do we, if this is really what our people and our farmers are saying, don't send us individual pumps, sell us good services that we can just purchase, then that's a different approach. That requires a different kind of support. It requires training. It requires extension. It requires government extension officers to come and help set these businesses up in a way that, that makes it profitable for these businesses to then run and then also offers good quality services to farmers who then have an incentive to keep coming back. And by the way, that also addresses uh, sort of Africa's food security issue, right? Because it is one of the continents where the per capita consumption of food is falling. Even the production of food is falling. There's more and more food being imported. And so if, as a policymaker, if we are, if we are concerned about that and we want to make sure that domestic production on the continent increases, 
one of the ways to do it is to get people f- to farm regularly and not to do this in and out. And how do you do that? You do that by offering quality services, good support, good public infrastructure. So again, it goes back to that whole question of you have to look at all of this as a package and not as these sort of you know piecemeal solutions. So in that sense, I think this, convers- this, this conference is great because it's exactly what we're hearing from, we heard from all those four people on the panel. You know, they were talking about how do we need the, as a collective to come and unlock this stuff. And I think these are some really important things that, that policymakers in the room need to hear. That's really all the specific questions I have. Um, we want to wrap up just in general about uh, how you feel about the future of food and, and agriculture and water management. I don't want to be this, you know, the specter of the feast, but it is going to get harder and harder to manage these 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 challenges. Um, in part because you know our populations are increasing, we need to feed more people. Uh, that means more food will have to be produced. The production of food is resource intensive. It's the only way to do it in order to, at least at the moment, as we understand, you know, technology and science. That's the way to do it to get people done and not have a famine. Right. But and it comes with consequences. It comes with environmental consequences. It comes with, you know, concentrations of chemicals, agrochemicals in the field, it, carbon, release of carbon in the air. The minute you till the soil, you release carbon into the air. And so and so and all of this is again happening against a backdrop where, you know, climate change is real, the benef- the, the costs and, and the damages from climate change are going to be disproportionately borne by, you know, low and middle income countries, the science tells us that. And so how do we do all this in in a context where, you know, the challenge is just becoming bigger and harder? Um, And and, and I think we may have to, you know, have sort of, you know, moving sort of from sort of hubris to humility, kind of say that maybe we may not be able to solve all of these challenges. And so to me, um, you know, the question I would ask a policymaker is what is the biggest challenge you have? And if it is yeah, we may have all these other challenges, but we still have poverty and a famine and people are not, you know, getting getting food. I mean, if that's where the focus is, that's where the focus is. I mean, it's it's understandable. And so I think there is a there's a set of really complex challenges that we need to that we need to sort of address and I think one way to address them better and to minimize those trade-offs is this kind of systems thinking, uh where we need to start thinking in an integrated manner and to say okay, if we need an expansion of irrigation in, in sub-Saharan Africa, how do we do it and yet keep a hold on the problem so that we don't lock ourselves into some of the challenges that are happening in South Asia? Or at least the nature of the challenge is not as extreme as it is in South Asia, right? I mean, people keep talking about groundwater exploitation in South Africa, and it's true groundwater resources are rapidly falling. But it's also what allowed a lot of people to cultivate and, you know, not, not, and have enough to eat and, and, and not be destitute. So, so there's a trade-off here. And, and so how do you, and, and I, I don't, and I don't know whether I, I am even qualified enough to, to, to make an ethical call on what the trade-off should be, but I think uh, orders of logic suggest that there is one, and then how do we manage that is really the question. So that's your first taste of the Water for Food Global Conference and the beginning of our series of interviews with speakers from the event. To find out more about that conference, just go to waterforfood.nebraska.edu and click on the front page link. Thanks for joining us this time on the Doherty Water for Food podcast. Make sure to visit our website, waterforfood.nebraska.edu, to view show notes or subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Mm -hmm.